Hello all, Old Geek here, and in this video I'm going to revisit an adventure that I've looked at before, but from a slightly different angle and in a little more depth. But before I begin, let's just, oh, oh look at the t-shirt, yes, yes, Old Geek t-shirt. Right, with that uh, out of the way, back in the first edition and second edition AD&D days, most adventure modules were relatively small, roughly 32 pages in size and typically taking 10 to 20 hours to play. Of course this depends on the play style, the design of the adventure itself and how the DM incorporates and develops the material provided. Some of the adventures would go on to last ages if they inspired the DM, others just a session. Wizards of the Coast have a very different philosophy. They don't produce small modules unless it's for Adventurers League. Instead, their adventures are either lengthy campaigns or collections of smaller scenarios. But it's fair to say, and I don't think this statement is biased or controversial in the slightest, that their new material has often been lacking in quality. When the question is raised about what is the best 5th edition adventure, with the exception of the well-regarded Lost Minds of Fandelver, a small adventure by Wizards of the Coast, which came with the 5th edition starter set, the adventures that get suggested as being the best are usually adaptations and or conversions of older material. And this is backed up by product rankings on gaming sites. RPG Geek, for example, is one such site. Before anyone suggests that they may, might be biased in some way, the 5th edition D&D rulebooks rank very highly on there. But the adventures? Of the five highest rated adventure books, four of them are based in some way on old material from the AD&D days. There's Curse of Strahd, Tomb of Annihilation, Ghosts of Saltmarsh, and Tales from the Yawning Portal. Only Storm King's Thunder bucks that trend. All the other adventures rank lower. But in this video I'm going to focus on one of those conversions. The official 5th edition version of Tomb of Horrors, which featured in Tales from the Yawning Portal. That book was a collection of dungeon crawls and included new versions of highly regarded old scenarios. White Plume Mountain, Hidden Shrine of Tomoachan, Forge of Fury. For most of them the conversion was fine and they work pretty well. But Tomb of Horrors. Well, first you need to know why Tomb of Horrors exists and what it was meant to achieve and for some people you need to discard any biases that you may have based on hearsay because they are probably incorrect. Spoiler warning, yes there will be spoilers in this video so if you're one of the few people to watch my videos who have neither played nor run this adventure you can kindly go away now find something else to do with your time. Gary Gygax wrote Tomb of Horrors specifically to challenge players who claim they could beat any dungeon. It went on to, to cement its place in history as one of the nastiest adventures of all time, a module in which the players had to be clever and imaginative in order to survive it, a module where the dungeon was trying to kill the PCs at every turn. It is a very specific type of challenge. It is all of the following, written to test the players, not the characters. It is extremely deadly. I wouldn't say it's the most deadly, but it's right up there. And it is filled with imaginative traps and iconic imagery. The Tomb of Horrors is none of these things. It is not suitable for campaign play. It is not suitable for groups who like constant action and it is not suitable for groups who like a plot 
and lots of people to interact with. It's also not unfair. I've seen so many people say, oh, it's unfair. It's not. The clues are there and you are meant to be able to play high level characters to their full capacity when you attempt this adventure. It's perfectly fair. So, what do I mean by testing the players, not the characters? Well, Tomb of Horrors expects the party to plan, exercise caution, and consider every move. It expects creative spell use, close examination of the environment, and alertness at all times. Also, it expects the players to metagame, because the module is testing them and not their characters. Simply put, it is not designed for characters to charge through, soaking up damage, blasting enemies with big combo attacks, and facing down a big bad guy at the end heroically. Then triumphing because they are badass. The puzzles contained inside are not meant to be circumvented by either skill checks or violence. You are supposed to be creative. Given that the adventure has been floating around for nearly 45 years now, it would be hard to have avoided the stories about how people dealt with some of it. Most commonly the first main corridor, scattered with lethal pit traps. The point was that skilled adventurers should not fall for these. If you travel to a dungeon knowing it is the tomb of a former arch lich, rumoured to be packed with traps, and you simply walk down that first corridor, then sorry, you are not up to the task. You're not a good enough player. What you should be doing is casting summoning spells and sending goblins or orcs down there instead. But if you're squeamish about treating imaginary evil humanoids badly, then go outside and round up some sheep and send those down instead. Okay, if you don't want innocent animals to die, why are you even playing D&D? Maybe create water and look to see where it flows into the cracks, thus revealing possible pit traps. Or what about using fly or levitate and avoid even touching the floor? One of my magic users once attempted to levitate his way around much of the tomb, using a 10-foot pole to push himself along. Granted, this was after the paladin fell down a pit, but still. And as for that big bad guy at the end, he's at the end of a lethal dungeon filled with death traps. Should your first impulse be to fight him directly? No. You use his own traps against him. Pick one. There are plenty. As I said, spoilers. Sorry about those. So what does all this have to do with the 5th edition conversion of the adventure that is found in Tales from the Yawning Portal? Okay. In the 5th edition version... The pit traps can be found using perception, the character skill. The poison needles cause damage rather than instant death. Oh, it might poison them for a few hours, but so what? The damage levels throughout the dungeon do not take into account the extra hit points and easy access to healing that 5th edition characters have. This makes a number of the previously deadly traps into little more than minor wasp stings. One of the sneakiest traps in the dungeon involves green slime and brown mould. In AD&D, green slime was lethal, and it was genius to combine it with brown mould, as you used fire to kill the slime, something that clever players would do, metagame it, yeah, metagame it, so what? But fire fed the mould. So you'd kill the slime and grow the mould. But in 5th edition, yeah, the mould is still quite nasty. But green slime, 
No, it's been neutered. Like a cute family pet dog that you don't want to breed. But the biggest travesty of all is the Demilich himself, as Sererak. You were not supposed to take him on in a straight fight. In fact, clever players simply avoided him. Or, as I said earlier, used his own traps to end his existence. The crown, the scepter, the sphere of annihilation, the lava. He was almost invulnerable to physical attacks and spells. Only very specific things could affect him in any way. But how would a party know that? Isn't that unfair? The players are meant to be prepared and to be creative. Consult ancient law, temples, sages before even setting off to find the tomb. Use divination spells. Clerics of the level needed for this adventure should be able to cast commune. But even lower level spells would give you clues. In the 5th edition version, yes, he has some spell immunity, but it's not unlimited. And any, any character with a magic weapon can hurt him. His soul drain ability now has a saving throw in order to avoid it, which it didn't have in AD&D. Comparatively, his armour class is a lot worse in 5th edition. So the PCs even have a good chance of hitting him, so long as they have a magic weapon. In AD&D, most classes could not even scratch him with physical attacks. You had to be a high-level fighter with a Vorpal Sword or a Paladin with a Holy Avenger. Very specific. You weren't meant to fight him in direct combat. You were meant to use that. So, they've made him beatable. A challenge, yes, but still beatable, using basic character skills. The ability to deal damage in combat. Not player skills. Only the cleverest and most creative players should be able to brag to the world that they have beaten the Tomb of Horrors. That was its legacy. That's why it was steeped in infamy. It wasn't the best module. It wasn't the longest. It wasn't the most exciting. It wasn't the most inspirational. But it was the most infamous. Its lethality and the imagery that backed up some of its most famous traps, those are the reasons why it has such a reputation. They made it memorable. But for the current generation, it's just another challenging dungeon. Yes, it's challenging. But it's a beatable one. Killing the Demilish? Pah! He's easy, mate. We did it before breakfast. It's akin to Trevor Burbick being able to brag about beating Muhammad Ali. Yes, it happened, but it was not the Ali of old. In summary, I'm going to use another example to give my verdict on the 5th edition conversion. But you can probably guess that I'm very negative towards this. Who was the baddest man in the Wild West? A number of names will be flung out, but some will probably suggest John Wesley Hardin. And they would have a strong case, as he was a nasty piece of work. OK, so say a modern film company makes an adaptation of his life, but changes the fact that he killed people. Instead, he wounds them and lets them live. People who don't know much about him might watch the film and start wondering why he had such a bad reputation, what all the fuss was about. It's the same for the 5th edition version of Tomb of Horrors. It feels like a listless, modern Hollywood remake. By watering it down, its reputation has been destroyed. At least the best 5th edition products are adaptations and remakes of old material. But 
so is the worst. If I, right, to fix it. This is what I would do to fix it if I had to run the 5th edition version using 5th edition rules. I would change a Cerorex armor class to at least 26. I would reduce any weapon damage against him to 1 point plus the weapon's magic bonus per hit. Because I'm aware you don't get plus 4 and plus 5 weapons in 5th edition D&D. Okay? I would make a Cerorex immune to fire, cold and electricity. You can't fire fireball him. You can't cone of cold him. Nothing like that. He's already immune to poison. I would remove the saving throw from his soul drain. If you touch his skull, your party's magic user, or the strongest spellcaster, is going to die on the first round. That's it. That's it. That's what's meant to happen. You're not meant to touch the skull. Simple as that. Or at least touch the skull physically. Stuff him in the back of holding. Chuck him in the uh, severe annihilation. I would change all poison damage in the tomb to instantly drop the victim to zero hit points. Okay, it's not instant death. But then I would make the pit traps close and lock. So they're at the mercy of death saves and stuck down there. Not evil. Do not allow the party to use any passive skills to find anything. I would make sure the players state specifically where they are searching at all times. Or they could use a spell. Find the path. Maybe. Locate object will give you clues. Especially if you walk through one of the things that takes all your stuff off you. I would double the damage caused by all damage dealing traps. That squishing trap at the start in one of the fake entrances. 5d10 damage. That would instantly kill most magic users in first edition of the level required to do this adventure. It would probably drop most magic users in fifth edition to half hit points. There we go. Double the damage. Or at least double the dice used. Make it 5d20. That would make it interesting. And also, I would spoil their long rests with nightmarish visions. And I would do this at random. So they could not predict that they could get a rest at a sensible time. Now I know in the first edition version, one of the keys to succeeding was to realise that you've got no real time limit. The thing is, in fifth edition, you heal so much faster. You've got so many character classes that regain abilities on short rests that simply resting all the time cheapens it because they can just wake up I'm on full hit points so that's my list of what I would do and then maybe just maybe you might restore the fear to this legendary module but ultimately I just run the first edition version using first edition rules because that's how it was supposed to be this 5th edition version, this 5th edition conversion, is an absolute travesty and should never have been made. 